Krishna of like Srila Prabhupada, he saw all kinds of stool-like things on the street. And he fed them. He became like a father, a mother, a friend. He extended himself like anything. And by his association, that stool became like a sweet gulab jamun. That is the power of association. I'd like to tell one simple foolish story which has a nice purport at the end. Recently I was in London whereby the order of the Vaishnavas I was undergoing some surgery I was getting so many messages of people praying for me. I was thinking I should do these surgeries every year. <laughs> I never, all the nice things I do, nobody prays for me. But anyways, it was the day I was to leave the hospital. I was going to go to somebody's house. And one devotee, <clears throat> a distinguished lady wanted to come to meet me. <clears throat> she lived five minutes from the house I was going to. So she was going to come in the morning and she called Govinda Prabhu. And I said, I'm going to be moving out this afternoon to this house. It's only five minutes, so tell her she could come to meet me there in the afternoon at five o'clock. So about seven o'clock, I'm wondering, where is this devotee? And finally she comes and she tells me the story of her day. You would like to hear? She called a devotee on his cell phone and said, is Maharaj there at this time? And he said, yes, he's here. Please come immediately. Now, the nature of cell phones is you can call someone and you don't know where they are. <laughs> they could be in Moscow or Bombay, or New York, or in a boat in the ocean. It's the same number. So somehow or other, she thought I was at the hospital. So she drove through London traffic. It took her about 45 minutes to reach the hospital. On the way, she called so I'm coming right now. Oh, yes, yes, we're expecting you. Where should I go? I said, come to the third floor. So she gets to the hospital. She goes to the third floor. I said, where are you? I said, I'm on the third floor. But I'm looking everywhere. I don't see you. I said, well, you just ask. I'm asking everywhere. He says, well, about a half hour later, she calls again. He says, I couldn't find you on the third floor. He said, but I'm here on the third floor. Where are you now? I'm at the reception. He said, I'm coming down right now to the reception. A half hour later, she calls. She said, I'm waiting at the reception. Where are you? He said, I'm at the reception. 
She said, what wing of the hospital are you at? I said, I'm not, not at the hospital, I'm at the house. <laughs> it was five minutes away from her house. Anyways, when she finally came, she was... She already had to go. <laughs> but I was thinking, Srila Prabhupada explained how these unnecessary necessities that man creates create so many complications in one's life. Just like we were told, Srila Prabhupada, he managed an entire worldwide society better than anyone can do today. By millions of times, he had no computers, he had no cellular phone, he practically never even used a telephone. He was against telex because he said people will, devotees will simply use it for prajalpa. He wrote letters by what we call snail mail. And how efficient he was. Yet with the coming of technology, so many complications. Srila Prabhupada said that Krishna consciousness, you can take a thorn to pull out another thorn with. He used this analogy in the sense that modern science, modern technology, all these modern things of the world, because people are so addicted to them, you can utilize, utilize all of these things in order to take out the thorn of people's attachments and complexities to these things. But if you're not very, very careful, you use one thorn to take another out, and you end up with two thorns. <laughs> and then three thorns, and four thorns, and soon you have 108 thorns. <laughs> this yukta vairagya of utilizing the things of this world in the service of Krishna must be done very, very carefully. Oftentimes, devotees, they take advantage of this concept of yukta vairagya, we could use everything in Krishna's service just to justify wasting their time and enjoying sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness is simple living and high thinking. We really don't need any of these things. We can utilize them to reach people. But we have to be very, very careful that we do not become implicated in what they were initially made for. Because basically all these technologies and sciences of the world were specifically made for sense gratification. There's a powerful energy behind them for that purpose. And we have to be very powerful in our conviction to actually use them in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, we'll get sucked into that energy. Computers. Yes, we can reach millions of people. And we can do so many fabulous things by utilizing them. Architecture, art, so many uh, accounting, However, Sham Sundar Prabhu told his first meeting with Prabhupada, he taught him accounting. He just drew a line in a piece of paper and said, you put the deposits here and the withdrawals here and everything, you're just right. It's perfect accounts. Now we have all these computers and it doesn't even match what Prabhupada did. <laughs> in fact, if the computer breaks down, you'll probably go to jail because you have no tax records. Yes. And soon we get 
sucked into that energy because it's so powerful. And we start utilizing them little by little. Maya just takes our attention away from that specific mission for Krishna. And we get sucked in by this very powerful force of Kali Yuga. Cellular phones, same way. They could be used very nicely in Krishna's service. I was recently in a class where a very senior sannyasi, before speaking, he told the whole audience, turn off your cell phones. We don't want any disturbances in this class. Everyone turned their cell phones off. And while he was just making a very, very critical point in his class, a cell phone went off in his pocket. <laughs> Sometimes I think it, Krishna just named it cell phone because when you're in prison, it's called a prison cell. And it's called a cell because you can't escape. <laughs> Wherever you go, you can't escape. Driving in a car, walking down the street. And to make it romantic, there's so many different types of ringers. Some are even chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Playing ragas or other Bollywood type hymns. <laughs> yes, they can be utilized very, very nicely in Krishna's service, but more often than not, they divert us because all these technologies were created to give persons a higher degree of sense gratification. They've actually been created by people whose purpose is to divert the masses away from Krishna, knowingly or unknowingly. So Srila Prabhupada talked about yukti vairagya, but we must be very, very careful not to fall into the trap of the complexities unless we're very, very fixed in our sadhana, unless we're really, really taking shelter of the holy names, unless we really have quality association of devotees, and unless we're really determined to make spiritual progress, then in a very imperceptible, subtle way, all of these things will divert our attention away from Krishna and drag us back into a state of consciousness that we rejected. Or as the analogy of association, by associating with these things, they could turn your gulabjaman consciousness into... Very good. <laughs> But if we have good chanting of Krishna's names, good association, and we really are fixed in our service attitude, then all of these technologies can help turn so many stool-like minds throughout the world into... We love Germans. This is very symbolic. Right? <laughs> it's the best part of the class. <laughs> so we must be very, very careful at every step. When this lady came, 
I was explaining these things to her. That just see how such a simple thing becomes so complicated. Just by a little bit of misunderstanding. But actually, that's what Kali Yuga is about. Simply through miscommunication and misunderstanding, there are world wars. There's hatred. If miscommunication and misunderstandings are not cleared up very quickly, they can escalate into something that's impossible to resolve in, in ordinary relationships. And the more things are depersonalized through so much technology and machinery, the more possibility there is for this type of miscommunication, which creates quarrel and hypocrisy. So many complications. And this lady cried. And she said, that's not the lesson I learned from this. She said, I learned from this that you cannot take the association of devotees for granted. I was thinking it was just such a simple thing to be with devotees, just to drive my car. But I was in through so many traffic jams, and I was making so many calls, and I was going upstairs and downstairs and upstairs and downstairs. And finally, when I got here, I realized the association of devotees is so precious, we should never think it's just something so easy to get. After millions and millions and millions of births, by Krishna's mercy, we get the association of devotees. We should never take it to be something ordinary. We should never think it to be something we deserve. You cannot criticize or offend Vaishnavas unless you take it to be something very, very ordinary. Something that you really think you deserve better than. But actually, to be in the association of those who love the Lord, or even those who are aspiring to love the Lord, is the ultimate gift of God. It is something that one out of hundreds and thousands of people will achieve. When we're coming to the temple, when we're meeting another devotee, do not just take it to be an everyday affair. It is a supreme blessing. And to the degree we cherish that blessing, to that degree we will benefit by it and we will advance in spiritual life. And all of these realizations come about when we take very seriously, with a grateful heart, the Lord's gifts. And in that spirit, we come together to chant the holy names. You know what a rare gift it is to be chastised by Bhavananda Prabhu? <laughs> or to hear the sweet words of Chandramali Maharaj? Or to just be in the presence of the aura of Bhakti Vigyan Goswami Maharaj, who's fought tirelessly, fearlessly against all odds. to establish this temple in Moscow. In 1971, Srila Prabhupada wrote several letters saying we should have a temple in Moscow, a beautiful temple. It's never been. 
all these years. We were just in some government house for so many years, yes? It was nothing. Persecutions by the KGB and communisms for years. One of our devotees here from Ukraine, Bardraj Prabhu, he was such a dynamic preacher and such a threat to the communist government. He was imprisoned, tortured. Priya Prabhu from Ukraine, who was also here with about 30 devotees. How much risk he had to take. Bhaktivigyan Goswami Maharaj, he was a PhD. The KGB personally brought him to their headquarters to convince him how dangerous the Hare Krishna movement was. He was just a new curious visitor. But after hearing how seriously they took it, he decided, this is a serious movement. <laughs> if the KGB takes this so seriously, it must be real. Krishna spoke through KGB agents to bring him to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada. Very difficult. But now, for the first time in history, we have Srila Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission, has land in the name of Iskan in Moscow. Nineteen seventy one, that's thirty six years after Prabhupada's order. It's finally being fulfilled. And each and every one of you, such special jewels. Never ever ever take anything in Krishna consciousness for granted. Or you'll lose it. Every devotee, every opportunity to chant the holy name, every time you pick up one of Srila Prabhupada's books, understand this is such an unlimitedly precious gift. I don't deserve it. Let me appreciate it with a grateful heart and chant Hare Krishna.